Uh, the one aspect of performance tuning we didn't talk about with databases uh, was caching. And no, this is not on the exam. We already clarified that. Uh, but this is an important enough concept that um, even though we don't like have a homework assignment about it, uh, for the same reasons as I wanted to explain how indices work and why it's important to index foreign keys and stuff like that, this is kind of in that same category of ways to be nice to your database and get a lot more bang for your buck out of the database. And again, <clears throat> even if you, despite doing this, you outgrow the platform as a service solution, you're still going to have to worry about this if you get big enough that you've got to roll your own. So the uh, basically the, the um, observation behind caching is the fastest database is the one that you never have to query at all because you already have the information you need somewhere else. So there's a number of ways that you can do caching, um, but one of them is the most obvious is that if the data underlying some particular query hasn't changed, then you shouldn't have to repeat that query. It would be nice if you just store that data somewhere and be able to retrieve it without having to do a repeated query. Also, <clears throat> sometimes doing the database query isn't even the most expensive part of the app. If you remember our new relic uh, graphs that we get, it sort of shows you how much time was spent in Rails, how much time was spent in the database, and then there's how much time was spent rendering. Rendering is actually pretty complicated, right? Because it's sort of assembling a page out of all these different pieces. So sometimes if not if the data hasn't changed and therefore the views that are rendered based on that data don't have to be re-rendered. So if you could just keep a copy of the pre-rendered views around and serve them automatically, that would save even more time. So as with any system where you're going to introduce caching, you have to make a few decisions. Like, first of all, what do you cache? And uh, in our case, there's at least uh, in, in SaaS applications built around Rails, which is representative of how other frameworks do it, there's at least two choices. You can cache essentially an entire page at a time, or you can cache parts of a page so that if you assemble a page from pieces, the pre-cached pieces save you some time. And then you have to decide, how do you know when the cached versions of things aren't valid anymore? Uh, in our case, basically the pattern is the truth lives in the database. So when the database changes, any views or parts of views that are based on those tables in the database may change and have to be invalidated. So we'll have an opportunity to see another design pattern in action for this. Um, as with a lot of these things, my goal is to give you the architectural idea of how this works in Rails, which is very similar to how it works in other frameworks. So I'm actually not going to show a lot of source code today. If you're interested in reading the details and seeing more examples, um, there is a Ruby on Rails guide for uh, how caching works. There you have more source code examples and stuff like that. But my goal for the course is just to give you the content. And if there were a final, this would be on it, but there isn't. So I just hope you'll pay attention anyway. So where can you cache things? Um, if we start all the way at the browser and end all the way at the database, uh, there's actually a number of places, right? So the, the name of the game in caching is if the request is going in that direction, how early can you turn it back? Because you can serve it without going any further. So uh, most of you probably are aware that your browser has its own built-in cache of pages. Part of the HTTP protocol is to negotiate when a page served from a server is no longer considered to be valid or might not be valid. But if you try to reload that page within that time limit, the browser will often be able to get it from the browser cache, and then you're done. You didn't even go out to the internet. If that doesn't work, the next stop is the web server. So that HTTP front end, uh, remember that the web server is the last piece of infrastructure that sees the entire HTML page as it's going back to the client. So if the web server could be assured that the most recent version of a particular page from your app is still valid because the data underlying it hasn't changed, then the web server can actually return the entire page from a page cache, which is actually a huge win because that request never even makes it to your app. Like your, even your controller doesn't even see it. Um, so for pages that don't change very frequently, page caching actually can be a major win because your, the Rails stack doesn't even know that those requests happen. What if that fails because there's no page that matches in the full page cache? The next thing you might try is the action cache in the controller. When would you use that? Well, basically, uh, and I'll show an example of this, but there are cases where even if the page content hasn't changed, there is something about the app logic that has to run to determine if it's okay to serve the page. Canonical example of this would be something like an action that you have to be logged in to do on the app. 
it may very well be that the content, the page you would see corresponding to uh, that action hasn't changed since the last time you visited, but there has somewhere there has to be a check for you being logged in. Otherwise, you're not allowed to go to that page at all. So these are cases where effectively you are still able to serve a copy of the entire page, but there is some application-specific logic that has to be run first to sort of make sure to give it the green light. Um, and in Rails, that's done with what's called the controller action cache. If that doesn't work, because maybe the page is out of date, um, there is still the possibility that uh, if, you, if you've been using partials to create your pages, uh, I think some of the more complex apps probably have them, but a partial is like a chunk of a view. And you can pull in the partials, for example, like if you're rendering a collection of model instances, uh, it's very common to have a partial that represents one instance and then just render the partial multiple times. It turns out that with a small change to your view code, the moment that you render a partial, you can also tell Rails, please cache this. And the idea is that once again, if the data underlying that fragment uh, or that partial doesn't change, then in the future when that page is rendered, rendering the partial just means pulling it out of the fragment cache as opposed to recomputing uh, what the actual tags and content should be. Um, and Rails manages most of this for you. And in particular, they try to name things in such a way that when the underlying data changes, the fragments are, it, it's easy to identify when the fragments have to be invalidated. So I will show an example of that. And then lastly, if none of those works, you have one last hope, which is that uh, at the level of the actual model, the model queries the database. And if that particular query has been done recently, and the database certainly knows whether the data for the query has changed or not, the database also has a query cache. So in this case, you've paid the price of having your application do the work, but you might still be able to save on having to send one more query to the database. And in the scheme of things, that's actually still good, right? Because everything to the left here is stuff that runs on stateless server columns. You can replicate more of those. That's just spending more money. But anything that saves work on the database and gives you more bang for the buck out of your database is worth doing, right? So these are sort of you know, five different places where caching could happen. Um, database caches and browser caches are pretty standard. The levels of caching in between vary somewhat depending on the framework. So for example, uh, because Rails has this built-in concept of constructing a view out of these pieces called partials, that's kind of a natural granularity at which to do caching as well. A framework that doesn't have that abstraction might not have sort of this level of caching, but it probably has something that corresponds to caching the entire view. So let's <clears throat> take a look at you know, how would those things work. So when can you use uh, full page caching, whether it's something that you're delegating to the HTTP server, or you're doing it as a, a controller action cache. Basically, it's when the entire action's output can be cached. Um, there are now, this used to be built into Rails, but it's now been pulled out so that people can do caching in different ways. Uh, but as I said, page caching essentially communicates with the web server, the HTTP server, and allows caching of pages indiscriminately. Like those, the cached page hits, you never even see that request come to your app. Now, it is incumbent on you to be able to tell the web server when it is no longer safe to serve the cached copy, how to invalidate it. <clears throat> uh, and then similarly with action caching, um, it's basically, uh, this allows any controller filters that would be associated with that action to run. So if the controller filter needs to turn back the, uh, because you're not logged in or whatever condition it's checking, but the idea is that if the controller filter says that everything is good, then the entire rendered page can still be served. So you, you did have to get Rails involved, but you sort of short-circuited most of it. Um, there is a big caveat about this um, that has to do with the fact that when you do caching, the names of cached objects are based on the page URL without optional parameters. Right? So for example, if this is the original URL, then in a world where you're doing page caching, this is the name of the thing being cached. In particular, if the parameters make a difference in how the entire page is supposed to look, then you can't safely use this name to do uh, page caching. You could do something like this, right? If you've got parameters that are actually encoded as part of the URI, um, and those parameters could affect how the page is displayed, this will work because now uh, changing the value of rating will actually result in an entirely different URI, different page. Things will sort of work as designed. <clears throat> 
Um, the way that Rails names things for caching actually is changing in Rails 5 in a way that makes this a little bit easier. So um, I don't anticipate most of you are going to have to, you know, you're not going to get to the point in your projects where deploying caching is a huge win. But again, if you want to read a little bit about how this works in real life, um, as a developer, you cannot get away from it. Right? So in this theme of what is it that developers have to worry about versus what is it that ops people have to worry about, the idea that you know, the web server can bypass the Rails stack and return a page, that's an infrastructure thing, right? Because in as much as you don't control the web server. But the knowledge of which pages are safe to cache in their entirety, when the page has to be invalidated because the underlying content may have changed, really there's nobody other than the app developers that knows the answer to that. So as an app developer, if you want to turn on caching for your app, you have to make specific changes that uh, encode those semantics. <clears throat> so the, uh, the, the reason I'm calling this a pitfall is that if you've got a control, I'll show you the source code example of this, but if you have a controller action that has different code paths within the same action um, depending on the value of something in a before filter, this will basically break your ability to do something like action caching. Um, but it'll be easier if I just show you an example. Okay, here's an example. So uh, if you've got the proper gems loaded, um, one thing you can do is you could just tell the web server, um, cache the entire index page. And in this example, that turns out to be wrong because if you look at the index controller action, it does different things depending on the value of some condition that is known only to the app. Right? So the, the HTTP server has no possible way of knowing if you're logged in because that is an app level concept. Um, yet we have basically told the server that it is okay to cache the page. That cannot possibly do the right thing. However, a way you could do the right thing is imagine that the version of the page you see if you're not logged in is the same for everybody. The version of the page that you see if you are logged in has some differences depending on the person, like maybe just because it shows you know, welcome and it shows your username or something. So in that scenario, we could actually separate out the two actions, right? So rather than put it, and by the way, the shorter your controller actions are, the better, right? Um, I'm guilty of having long controller actions as much as anyone, but the controller should be a really thin layer. And in particular, it's just fine to have two different actions. The public index looks the same for everyone. The logged in version of the index will maybe set up some variables that uh, rely on you being logged in and will look different for each user. So the public index page is certainly safe to cache because by definition, we're saying it's the same for everyone. So we can still say cache is page for that. Then for the logged in index, we can say it caches the action. What does that mean? It means that um, we allow the before filters to run, but given that the logged in index has run and produced a certain view for a certain user, given a certain URI, given a certain cookie and set of variables, it's okay to cache that same thing, um, and Rails will make sure that different users are getting different cache versions of this, right? Because the, the action caching allows the controller to run um, before actually deciding that it's okay to serve the cached action. So basically, the, the bottom line is whenever you can separate controller actions that behave the same for everybody and controller actions that require a before filter or might behave differently for different users, you should do so. In other words, separate things that change from things that stay the same. <clears throat> what if you can't, uh, if it's not practical to use page caching or action caching, the other option is something like fragment caching. And the idea there is that as you're rendering a partial, which is a, a little chunk of a page, at that moment, you can save that partial together with whatever underlying data was used to render it. So, for example, um, if I've got uh, somewhere in my view, I'm bringing a collection of partials where each partial is uh, one line on a show me all the movie screens, um, I can direct Rails to cache it under that name, and that all by itself will be sufficient that the next time Rails has to render this view, if the cached version is still around and has not been invalidated, then the render collection won't happen at all. Instead, Rails will just be able to pull the result of having done the render collection previously out of the fragment cache and, and incorporate into the page right away. So if you've got complicated rendering with a lot of partials, this can actually save quite a bit of time. And we haven't discussed yet how invalidation happens, but we're going to get to that next. Right? So all of these are conditioned on there's machinery to check whether the cache version is still there and safe to use. If so, some time is saved by avoiding an operation. In this case, the operation that was avoided is having to re-render the collection of partials with all of the underlying data. So the question still to be answered is, 
how do we detect when the cache versions no longer match the database? Because basically, you know, the, the whole point of rendering a view is if the data underlying the view, in this case, something about the way at movies was assigned, if that might have changed, then the view might no longer be safe to cache. We sort of have to conservatively assume that when the underlying data may have changed, the view has to change as well. So how do we do that? Um, this is an example of another design pattern we get to introduce, which is called Observer. Um, and Observer is a pattern that is used when one class wants to know about specific interesting events happening in another class. So in this case, um, the caching mechanism wants to know when interesting things happen in the movie model, because if movies are updated, then any cached things related to movies might have to be invalidated. So, but on the other hand, you don't want to sort of pollute the movie model with having to keep track of that, right? The movie model doesn't care about these things. It's actually the caching model that cares. So we say that in this scenario, the caching model is an observer. The thing it is observing is the movies model. And uh, a really nice implementation of this that you, you may have already guessed if you're a step ahead of me is Active Record provides those nice lifecycle hooks like before save, after save. Remember how when we talked about validations, these are hooks that are automatically called at various times. That same technique of aspect-oriented programming um, is used to actually implement this. Uh, so as usual, I will show the code on the screen, but you can also, uh, offline, you can link through to the gist and look at the code for yourself. But here's what the gist points to. Um, if we want to enable caching uh, at whatever level, let's say for the movie model, we set a separate class which inherits from caching sweeper, which is another piece of machinery that comes with the Rails framework. And we just say observe movie. Isn't that cool? So basically that will install the correct, uh, um, it will add lifecycle hooks that are uh, tied to the after save callbacks so that any time uh, the movie's table is basically modified, right? If a movie is edited or something is inserted, uh, then the, in, the cache sweeper can be notified about that. Um, and in particular, we're gonna say that uh, if a movie is saved, then we're going to invalidate a bunch of stuff. If a movie is destroyed, deleted, we're gonna invalidate a bunch of stuff. And in this case, our invalidate action is really simple. It's very conservative, right? Um, basically, if, so we're saying, if basically anything has changed about any movie, we're going to blow away any page cache or full size page caches related to the index action. And we're gonna blow away any page cache related to the show action. Um, now, this second one is pretty inefficient, right? Because if only one movie got updated, and if we had cached pages for the show action for like all other different movies, there's no reason that those other ones should have to be blown away, right? They haven't changed. So this is kind of the most naive, conservative, but safe version of this because you'll never get a false positive, right? Th there's no possibility that you will accidentally leave behind a cached page that is no longer valid. In real life, you can do much better than this, even with page caching. Um, and the new uh, cache naming in Rails 5 specifically allows you to cache based on the action and something like the ID of the model instance. So you could say, um, only expire the cached pages that correspond to the show action for a particular movie, leave the other ones as they are. Right, but in this really simple example, I've chosen not to do that. I've done the most conservative, naive thing that could possibly work. Um, also, if I was using the fragment cache, like I had the example on the previous slide, where every time I render the list of movies with ratings, I'm caching the results of each one of those fragments, um, I also need to expire all the fragments. So since in my example, uh, the entire collection of fragments was saved under a single name, I just call expire fragment with that name and that blows it away. Um, and then at the top of movies controller, you just say, by the way, you're going to be cached. And that, this is the, the line that will essentially trigger the loading of the movie sweeper and installing the hooks to observe the movie and all that stuff. So it's actually fairly clean, right? It's a nice separation of concerns. All of the information about what is to be cached, when it is to be invalidated, and how the invalidation happens, that's all in this separate class called movie sweeper. The controller and the movie model don't have to know anything about it. The only thing you have to do is in the controller is advise it that it is going to be observed by a cache sweeper. Um, <coughs> now, one thing I haven't said at all is if the idea is that you're caching chunks of stuff, where are the chunks of stuff being stored, right? They're certainly not being stored in the database, uh, which isn't very good practice. 
But the short answer here is that this is, if you turn on caching in your Rails app, this is a configurable option. Uh, you tell the app where you want the cache to live. There's a really, really popular piece of distributed software called memcached that has been around for eons and eons. That is one possibility. There are separate caching as a service add-ons that you can deploy in Heroku, and you can tell the, uh, the sweeper to put it there. Um, if, you're if you're running this on a platform as a service where you actually have access to the local file system, the cache files can just be temporary files in the file system. And th the nice thing about all of those implementation methods is that because of the way caching is defined, right? caching is an optimization. So it is always safe to delete cached things that might be valid. Um, if you're running uh, your cache on top of like a cache store like memcached, what happens if you run out of space to cache more things? Well, you just start evicting stuff, right? Um, ideally, it'd be nice to evict the ones that are not used very often, but in terms of correctness, it doesn't matter what you evict. In fact, you could blow the entire cache away at any time, and there would be no effect on correctness, only on performance. So um, caching is pretty forgiving in this regard, and uh, I think kind of for me, the takeaway message is have a principled way to talk about caching and the policies and the logic of caching that is separate from the things being cached. Um, and I think this mechanism is a pretty nice example of how to do it. Um, <clears throat> so, when we, so again, one reason to do caching is that it's nicer to your database, but in terms of things like page and fragment caching, often the bigger win is that you're being nice to your app. So when we talked about things like indices and how much time does it say, you know, how much more bang for the buck can you get out of your database by using indices rather than not? Here, we might also ask, how much more bang for the buck can you get out of each dyno if what you're saving is the time to do computation and rendering so that you can instead return fragments or pages that have already been cooked? How much time does that save you? Um, so again, we, do, we did like a little you know, micro benchmark with this with our, our favorite app um, with about 1,000 movies, 100 reviews per movie, and basically doing uh, just simple views of movies along with their reviews. Um, and what we measured was the total response time with and without caching turned on for sort of a, a random sampling of these requests. Um, but depending on how you want to do the math, uh, eight times to 21 times as many users with the same number of servers. So again, this is a case where we haven't come close to saturating the database. So saving effort or time on the database is actually not the big win here, right? The big win is that the same number of app servers are going to be able to do more work and serve more users. So that's a money savings as well.